and balance means, right? About the same. You know, veer, vary a little bit, but about the same. And why this balance is so important, it has to do with inflammation. Inflammation is our body's go-to normal process of the immune system. These days, inflammation gets a bad rap because it is uh, going on too much and too long in the human body. But in fact, when it's operating normally, it's just what we want. Because say you have cancer or early onset of cancer, inflammation is what takes out cancerous cells and abnormal cells. And that's, that's perfect. That's what we want. Get them out of the body. Say you fall down, you've got a wound, you want that wound to heal, inflammation is a part of that process, a part of rebuilding the cells and the tissues so they can get up and running again. This is the beneficial side of inflammation. And so what immunologists have uh, sort of deduced through time is that certain fats, they start inflammation, like there's a lot of challenges out there and we we want inflammation to start here it is boom boom we've got a wound uh oh onset of cancer yeah 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 inflammation it goes up we're going to get solve those problems and then inflammation is going to come down so omega 6s it turns out start this process and if omega 6s are our our bodies are filled with them uh what you, can happen is that inflammation goes on and on and on. But what if the problem's taken care of? Then you've got inflammation that is actually, it becomes damaging to our cells and tissues. Inflammation is a pretty heavy duty process, right? It's killing cancer cells, it's healing wounds. And so when, it, and when, when you've got that problem solved, you want inflammation to come right on back down. It's what we call the resolution phase. It's not really about an anti-inflammatory. It's about resolving inflammation. It's like just the way you turn a garden hose on to water something, you don't just walk away and leave that hose running, right? You go over to the, the handle and you turn it off. And so omega-3s, this is how they, this is what their role is in inflammation. So you want to have enough omega-3s stored away there in your cell membranes so that your immune cells can access it and use it. These omega-3s are the building blocks for compounds that do all of this signaling and communication to end inflammation. The cytokine storms, you know, that we heard about during COVID, that was runaway inflammation. I've always had this question, was giving infusions of omega-3s, was that ever thought of as a therapy for resolving inflammation? I think it's something that, that we should all be, not, not infusions of omega-3s, but given that the pandemic's gone on for years, we're probably looking at more of it, maybe we ought to consider getting more omega-3s into the human diet, right? And if, if we're choosing to eat animal foods, this is the importance of leafy living plants with phytochemical diversity and richness in the diet of our ruminants. All right, in essence, fat balance is part of a person's health plan, right? Okay, on the human microbiome. We're not a ruminant. <laughs> no, but we have a kind of a rumen-like place in our digestive tract, and that is in the very basement of our digestive tract. Um, it's down here in the colon. Look, look at how bacterial populations and numbers increase as you move down. That's a big, big change by the time you reach the colon. This is the heart of our microbiome. And so when we eat plant foods in particular, now whole plant foods, not simple plant foods, whole plant foods, we don't have all the enzymes that digest those plant foods. They make it down to our colon and our microbiome gets a hold of that and it starts fermenting it. And this, my friends, is another biological bazaar. We're feeding our microbiome and it is churning out different compounds that affect our health.
And one of the things we now know is that phytochemicals in the human diet, just like the ruminant diet, they're embedded in these whole plant fibers. So we're eating those in our fruits and vegetables. Our animals are out on their pastures. And in it comes, lands in the ruminant and animal, it sails on down to the lower reaches of our digestive tract. Our microbiome gets a hold of that. And voila, what we have here is another case of microbial metabolites. And so this is really, really important to consider because too often we think of nutrition as I'm just eating this carrot or I'm just eating this bowl of yogurt. While that is the case, what you're also doing is you're providing a feedstock, so to speak, to your microbiome and your microbiome is turning parts of, or in some cases, a whole molecule or compound into other things. And the, the effects of some of these microbial metabolites, oh, anti-cancer, anti-inflammation, anti-diabetic, brain health, heart health, and so on. Uh, I look at all of those things and I'm like, oh, that looks a lot like what pharmaceuticals do, except that they're made in our own bodies. So in some ways, the human microbiome, you, you have your own inner alchemist or your inner pharmacist right there, but leave it unnourished and your microbiome is not going to be churning out the kinds of metabolites that have all of these kinds of effects, right? Okay. So this is a part of a person's health plan. And this is why farming practices matter so much. We want our crop, we want our crops to be suffused with phytochemicals and a balance of fats. Uh, and that ripples on into uh, our animal foods and it's a part of their health plan, particularly with phytochemicals. Because one thing we know about the botanical world is that, remember that slide, thousands if not tens of thousands of different phytochemicals. You want a diversity of phytochemicals in the human diet because you want your microbiome to have as much as possible to work with so that it has the ability to churn out beneficial metabolites. All right, and so the, the way we raise these animals and crops, are we is there massive soil disturbance, massive disruption of fetching fungi, of the way that exudates uh, tee up beneficial processes with the plant microbiome? Um, are, we, are we overusing synthetic uh, chemicals, whether it's fertilizers or pesticides and herbicides that are just scuttling and scrambling the microbiome in the soil? and thus the nutrient profile in crops. So it turns out when it comes to these Fab Four, and there is way more research, information, evidence, and everything in the book on all of this and how it works, what we know is it profoundly influences our health. And so, sure, there's a little bit of, you know, you are what you eat, but it runs deeper than that. We really <clears throat> are what our food ate. And so there's really a lot of common ground when it comes to the microbiomes. It's a sort of a, a real foundation, whether for crops, animals, or people, because these are these biological bazaars. They're incredibly active, dynamic uh, areas where trading and exchanging is going on nonstop. And a big outcome of these biological bazaars are all of these microbial metabolites. And on the whole, we want way more beneficial than we do uh, detrimental metabolites. Huge role, as I have explained, in immunity and defense for plants, animals, and people. And this really is a form of nature's intelligence that I believe uh, if gardeners and farmers tapped more into conservation, stewardship, nurturing, and caretaking of microbiomes, we could get a lot more
benefit out of the microbiomes that are there and that have always been there in the soil, the human gut, and the rumen. And so it's been a lot of information. Thank you so much for hanging in there. It, pretty much it comes down to this. If something is good for the land, for crops and ruminants, it is good for us too. And back to sort of these series of books, really it comes down to dirt lays out that problem. The hidden half of nature, we've got an insight and a cure. And we've got the how to in growing a revolution. And that all rolls up into the consequences of agriculture for health and well-being. All right, that concludes our thought. And I think we're happy to take uh, any questions now, if there are any. Okay. And, yep, here comes Thank Dave. You. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you, Anne. That was a really uh, wonderful presentation. So, uh, well, we can do a short Q&A. Um, we take audio, uh, questions from the audience. And let me just explain to the audience real quickly um, how we're going to go about it. We don't take questions directly from chat. What we do is we raise our hand in Zoom. So the, um, on the bottom of Zoom, second to the right, you'll see a reactions button. You'll click on the reactions button and you'll select raise your hand. And, um, and then we will pick on you in the order in which you uh, raised your hand. When it's your turn, I will unmute you and you can state where you're from and ask your question. We ask everyone to keep their questions brief and on topic. Uh, we will then be uh, the audience member asking the question. And if they do wish to ask another question, then they can raise their hand again. So let me see if there are any questions from the audience real quickly. And give me one second here. And I think you probably answered everyone's question. So... Um, let me ask you a couple questions here myself. Um, so, you, well, you went you went over extensively um, uh, the, on the uh, on the effects of modern culture on soil and the, the health of the soil and kind of how it works its way up. What types of modern day illnesses and and sicknesses do you think are coming from the the poor health of our soil that's working its way up through through what we eat what what that eats <laughs> i don't know if that came out right but i think you understand yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it did well it a lot of these chronic diseases that are affecting an awful lot of folks these days they tend to be um either some kind of you know a metabolic disorder of some some sort or maybe cognitive or neurological and we know for example that omega-3s are really important to cognition and the way that our nervous system works and you sort of swamp uh, the human diet with omega-6s and so this comes in the form of uh, mostly seed oils so you know you take a safflower seed and you smash it get the oil out of that you put that in some kind of ultra ultra processed food product and it's sort of like a pipeline of omega-6s into our diet and therefore our bodies and so that means that omega-3s are in short supply and uh, all of a sudden you know cognition is affected there's been uh, studies that show sort of low levels of omega-3 uh, put people at risk for depression for mood disorders so if you are eating animal products this is why it is they really are an overlooked source of omega-3s in the human diet but only if these these animals truly are eating uh, on pastures with a diversity of plant species which then makes for a diversity of phytochemicals and also living plants. That's that's a source of the omega-3s. Phytochemicals as well uh, are implicated in various kinds of um, anti you think disorders arising from too much inflammation and not enough of the cleanup crews, the, 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 the cleanup processes. And so phytochemicals, you know, it doesn't sound very sexy to say, eat phytochemicals they're your janitor but i'm afraid to say um 
they are they are just the best janitors out there they're helping our bodies they're getting rid of all these dust bunnies and all of this crud that is sitting there in our cells and tissues right we don't want anything gunking up cells and tissues we want them working normally because we want normal metabolism normal cognition normal mood okay great i think we've got like a like one more minute to have a question answered um so i'd like to end on an optimistic note because so many things in this world are so scary you talked um david you talked about uh the optimism you have with regard to uh rebuilding our soil um do you see signs of it becoming more popular in you know and kind of um taking off in, in in ways that it may actually become prevalent or is it just more like the the farmer here and there <laughs> no I, I i see a lot of potential for it to really take off uh back in uh when did dirt come out back in 2007 when dirt came out there was hardly there's not much talk about soil health uh in the agricultural world let alone in the general public there's a big surge of interest in regenerative agriculture uh both among farming communities and farmers uh, but also among climate activists interested in putting carbon in the ground and taking it out of the atmosphere, and increasingly uh, from consumers as well who are interested in the kind of things that Anne was just talking about. So I see a huge potential for it to go forward. But, you know, as a geologist, I'm, I'm a little patient. Uh, I, I, I think I could see uh, regenerative agriculture sweeping through agriculture over the next 20 or 30 years. So if we think about the shape of agriculture around 2050, or so the middle of this century, it might be really different than what we see today. And it's my hope that these practices that we that we can sweep under the regenerative agriculture umbrella will become the conventional agriculture of the future and that we can harvest all the attendant environmental and health benefits that would come with that. But it's, you know, it's at the start of that transition, but I'm very hopeful and optimistic because I see the interests of the environment, the economy, and our own individual and, collect, and collective public health all lining up in the direction that suggests that this is the way to go. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, David, for that, that really extensive and wonderful presentation. Um, real quickly, uh, we're gonna give the audience the opportunity to thank you as well with a cacophony of appreciation. We're gonna unmute their mics. Oh, you can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Very fascinating. Thank you once more. Really appreciate it. As the audience, that was marvelous. That was marvelous. That's great. That's happening. Yeah. All right. Love, love. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So stay tuned for our next lecture. Who uh, lecture?